Hi, this is Addie Olvera, and I'm here with Jim Soper, a Voting Rights Task Force and Counted as Cast. And I am from Ballots for Bernie, and we formed a coalition, California Election Integrity Ta Coalition, to um, help prepare for the upcoming election starting November. And I think it's really important that we cover as many topics as possible to help make um, everyone aware of what is um, our election processes in California nationwide. We're very lucky to have Jim. He's very knowledgeable, he's an expert. He's been following election and voting issues for a very long time. And today he's here to talk to us about what is the election processes. And we're gonna cover again federal, any federal issue or uh, some California specific questions. We're hoping that as we go live that you'll join us um, and make comments, ask questions, and we're gonna try to answer every question that you bring up. Another thing that you can do today is help share this video and so other people who um, would like to know more about voting and election issues or justice, ways to get involved, then this is our fifth video and please share it. You can also go to Ballots for Bernie, um, the community page under video and you'll see the other four uh, videos that we've been showing this series. We'll have two more and then we, we're gonna invite you to come to our conference in October 8th and 9th, which is Take Back the Vote. You can find it under tinyurl.com, Take Back the Vote, and uh, we'd like you to come join us. So, hi, Jim. Hi, Eddie. How are you doing? We're doing great, and I'm uh, really glad that you're here with us. Why don't you start off by just giving us a little introduction of what we're talking about today. Um, this is going to, I'm a programmer, and this is going to be about the election systems and what happens around them on election day and a little bit after election day. There's a lot of hidden pieces that people don't know about, and they, if you're going to go in and observe elections, or if you're going to be a poll worker, you should know about these things and understand where some of, some of the vulnerabilities are, and we're going to cover those. So why don't we start off with a very, you know, simple question, but, you know, maybe not simple to everybody. I think election issues are very complicated. So let's start off with, what is a poll book? Well, let's go to the chart, okay. and I'm going to take about 10 minutes just to walk people okay. through this and throw in questions when I'm getting hard to understand. Great. I'm going to walk people through it, and... Um, then at the end we can we can go into all of these other sounds dishes. great sounds great so everyone if you are curious what we are talking about on the video here you'll see a link to this diagram or you can uh, look at it by um, um, just uh, what we're showing you here okay First of all, if you go to countedascast.com, countedascast.com, you'll see at the top something that's this diagram. That will get you to this page. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's how you jump to it. Mm -hmm. uh, can we scroll it back to normal? Yeah. I'll point out a few pieces. Everything that's going on above the yellow piece is generally what's going on in the precinct. And what's going down below, here below, is the county. In the mid middle, we, this, this diagram, by the way, was done in 2006. And I no longer have the software, so I can't redo it, but 10 years later, it's still applicable because the equipment that we're using is so old and they haven't been updating it so it's this still works we all, we a new another term that came in aside from the central tabulator is that this central piece is called the election management system EMS and we have the precinct up here and we'll start with step one now is the tabulator the election management system before the election, the, the administrators sit in there and they type in all of the names of all the candidates and all the propositions and they type in the precincts. 
and they create for each precinct a ballot definition file which is for each machine saying okay you're in this precinct here's what should be on the ballot and they produce that at the tabulator and they put it into the touchscreen voting machine or the optical scanners or ultimately down into the central scanners that's the first piece this ballot definition file does not get checked it does not get verified and that's a whole because people can do things like leave out races or uh, I forget his name now but somebody in Riverside County had discovered that for the Sequoia systems they keep a separate databases for different languages so that you could have Chinese corresponds to Jim Soper and you have the name in the Chinese and then the Chinese name would be appearing on the screen for the Chinese user only somebody could flip the names in Chinese and have Jim Soper replaced with in Chinese Donald Trump and nobody would catch it unless they read Chinese so that's a that's a hole right there that's the, the translation database so coming out of there we go into the touchscreen machine in the optical scanner we scroll down scroll. okay now the voters we have on this side a touchscreen machine that were also called the DRE direct recording electronic but it's the touchscreen machine sort of like an ATM machine and an optical scanner one of two ways you can basically vote the voters are going to come in but well, first of all yeah the people at the check-in at your precinct are going to somehow get a list of who is allowed to vote in that precinct and that goes to that first question what is a poll book that contains the list of people who can vote in that precinct what has changed this year in California is that this has come online so the poll books are now coming online they connect to a central database which can be hacked and one of the problems we saw in California and I strongly suspect elsewhere is people arriving to vote and not being able to vote normally because their voter registration had changed and it's when you get into situations where somebody said, well, gee, I've been voting Republican for 20 years. What's this Peace and Freedom Party I'm registered in now? Huh? They don't know. And there was, unfortunately, a lot of those, plus Riverside County admitted that their voter registration database had been hacked, the officials, along with Illinois and Arizona. So this is vulnerability it's always been there was obvious but it's coming out now in California because they're bringing it online and this can be done with people either inside the system that means a in most voting officials are honest and then they just want to do a correct job but there's a few that have been sent to jail or the people who are programming the system can also do things so there's a vulnerability there but they have the, the poll book and the voter comes in and says, I want to vote. And they check you across the, the poll book and say, okay, if you're going to vote on a voting, uh, uh, voting machine with a touch screen, they're going to give you a card, the size of a credit card, which says to the machine, this precinct. And you go to the voting machine, you put the ballot card into the machine and you make your selections. When you're done, you go back and you return the ballot card to check in and you go home. If you're the other kind of voter, you get a ballot. You fill it out and you put it in a precinct optical scanner. And that goes into the scanner and it reads uh, what, what your selections were and stores that inside of the memory. Are we clear so far, Eddie? I think so. <laughs> okay. So the next step, that's step four and five, and we get down to six. 
when they closed the precinct, several things happened. One, the memory card gets put in a bag and sent back to Cotty headquarters. And it's going to get sent along with some other things that we'll get to at step nine, but we're in step six. Those memory cards, again, which are about the size of, oh, an old modem card, but bigger than a credit card again, thicker. And they're old. These things are 10, 20 years old. They go back and they have a, a, a device, sort of like your CD-ROM reader. You put the card in, it's directly connected to the tabulator. And this, the people have, the, the officials have the computer, the election management system, read the card. That card is a ballot box, an electronic ballot box, which contains all the votes and should be treated as such. And sometimes, oh, it's just a card, it's not important. No, that's, that's the ball game right there. And they put it in to the tabulator where it gets recorded and then the tabulator will add up all the votes. Now, where do we go to, that was step six, step seven. Um, during the day, the county will, or during the evening, the county in California has to send their results every couple of hours to the Secretary of State's office, not over the internet. California law prohibits election systems, voting systems, from being connected to the internet. Um, this may not be true for every state, but it's true for California, amen. And they will all send information up to the Secretary of State who gives you county, Alameda County with 35% of precincts reporting, here are the results. So that's going on. And where do we hide step eight? Why don't we scroll up and find step eight? It's down here. Also from, well, from this memory central scanner. As they close on election night, some people are gonna come in with their vote by mail ballot and hand it over to the people at the polling place. Now, this is a good idea because before that ballot leaves, you're supposed to count how many vote by mail ballots they have, put them in a secure bag and send them back to the county. So those, those will go on. If for some reason the, there was a problem with the registration or for some other reasons, you can file a provisional ballot, which we did not have in 2000 and it would have changed the election if we had had that. But you can put in a provisional ballot with your name, address, and everything, and you give that to the people at the polling place. So the vote by mail ballots and the um, Provisionals are going to go to the county into a box that I just call auditing. That by itself is a whole nother live stream or day, if you want. There's this enormous amount of things to talk about there. But they also they go, the balance go in there, but they also, first of all, will go into the central scanner. Back at headquarters, they have a high-speed scanner and they feed all of these absentee and vote by mail ballots through the scanner and it knows which precinct and who got how many votes. The post office will also deliver uh, ballots to county headquarters and they will go through that central scanner. Um, so we're, that takes care generally of step eight. All of these ballots then are going to go into the auditing box where they're going to be audited over the next, in California, 30 days, the canvas period. And that's pretty much it. Except I want to mention something and, and I had a photograph here. Can we get sort of uh, scanned back to just the whole general view? Sure. Everything is going through that election management system. It is the most important piece in the entire puzzle. And it's also the weakest link in the entire system. 
anybody who has the password can sit down and change it. Go look at, there, Bev Harris has, and I hope we'll show at the conference, a tape of her sitting down with Howard Dean and in just a couple of minutes changing votes on a tabulator. If you have the password, you're in. Sometimes the passwords are exam or is, they're, they're in the code and they're as complicated as 1111. This is the most important piece of the whole game. All of the totals are there, and it is the most in, most vulnerable. I have a photograph which I will try to post somehow from November 2006. I go, I don't go out to the precincts and watch there. I go to, to central headquarters and watch the tabulator. When you're doing that, you will see them get into, as the, the memory cards come in, they're going to go into a rhythm. Do this, then this, then this. That's just a pattern. When they break that pattern, just wake up, pay attention, because something's going on. Probably not bad, but wake up. In this case, at about 11.30 at night in November 2006, I saw two gentlemen sit down at the computer, that is the tabulator. They had an end of day tape. I didn't mention that, I needed to get that. The end of day tape is this long adding machine type of tape that at the end of the day, uh, the precinct officials are supposed to print out. And they're supposed to print out at least two copies. One of which in California should be posted in a window someplace for public view. If you are going to watch a precinct, take a photo or a long video of that in detail. Document that, what that piece of paper said. Because that should match ultimately whatever the county says, the machine set told the county, those things should match. If they don't, we have a problem. So they should post that after they, they close the polling place and they're wrapping things up, they need to print that end of day tape out, post one of them up, and then they send the other back to the county. Well, what these two gentlemen had was an end of day tape. And there was no collect close election that day. I checked, so I didn't freak out, but I did go ask the, an official, what was that about? And they said, oh, a janitor locked up the memory card in a closet. But they had the end of day tape, and one, the t one of the gentlemen was an official f from San Francisco. The other was working for ES, and that's the voting machine company. And they sat down as a pair and typed in some numbers. They could have been typing in anything. Absolutely anything. And there's nobody to check and note what's going on. We have a, a problem here <laughs> with the system. And, even I, somebody, if you have a large enough team for each county, somebody in the team should be going to the county headquarters and watching this going on, even if they don't know, even if you don't know about computers. They don't know that you don't know. Let them know that you're watching. Uh, so that's what I do. Only I have an idea of what's going on, and I let them know that I have an idea, and I think that just sort of helps secure the system. That's about it for the walkthrough. Um, hey, do we have any? Thank you, Jim. So, as you've seen, this is a very intricate uh, voting system process, and what you saw, on the, what, where you're seeing on this diagram, is a national uh, guide for what may be happening in your state. Um, in California, we mostly use the optical scanner um, uh, computer, and I was also a poll worker in Contra Costa County here in California. And just watching uh, Jim go through this diagram has just brought so many horrid flashbacks of the whole, the whole day for me. So, um, some good ones, but mostly just, oh crap, we're in trouble. And um, I don't know that we see uh, 
us having a solution for this in November or any in the next few years. It just seems like you can't fix one section or fix it all at the same yeah. time. Um, so I'm going to ask you really quick, because uh, a few things that came to mind. I noticed that in uh, Contra Costa County, the results that were being tabulated at the center were being sent over fax. So how do we know if their fax machine is going through the internet or an actual landline? That's one thing that you've prompted in my mind. And the reason I knew that is because I went and I asked, hey, the results that you have um, uh, online on the SOS are not matching what we're observing. And Contra Costa County chose not to upload the results on a daily basis. I noticed that every county did that differently. Alameda County did it differently. Uh, San Francisco County did it differently. They all just depended on how big or how small each county was. Um, and the other thing that I noticed, when you went on to the auditing section on this diagram, our county only audits precinct votes. They don't audit um, vote by mails, and they don't audit um, Pre uh, provisionals. provisionals. So that's another thing that I caught you, you know, that is a little, you know, and I always wondered why can't they audit the provisionals? Why can't they audit uh, a vote by mails? Well, that one's up for debate in San Diego, and Ray Lutz has launched a lawsuit just on that point. Of, no, I don't. California requires that you check one percent of the precincts, the totals from those precincts, against the ballots from those precincts, and that's where you start. One percent is way too much for a landslide race and it's way too little for a close race, but that's what the law says and so that's what they have to do. Only there is sections of the law that say uh, you have to do the 1% mm -hmm. tally and Ray has said, well, San Diego didn't do all of the provisionals and they didn't do all of the vote by mail. The counties like to say that the, especially the provisionals come in last or they're dealt with last, plus they are getting vote by mail ballots now as late as Friday. And both of them have to be processed, they have to be checked to see if the registration was proper, a whole bunch of things. So that takes time and they're claiming that when, when we do that, we're not going to have enough time within the 30 day period, period to then include them into a hand count of 1% of them. That's debatable, and Mr. Lutz has now taken it before court in San Diego and said uh, he's, he's saying the law says you have to do it. Uh, we'll let the judge make a decision on that. That should be in just about just before our conference on October 8th and 9th. In the middle of that week, the trial will take place in San Diego, and let's see what they say. If the judge doesn't agree, then we have something we need to talk with Sacramento about because, yes, they need to be properly audited. Mm -hmm. You said, well, there, there are all these gaps in there. Yeah, how do you check them? Count the ballots. When in doubt, count the ballots. Right. So that's, yes. that's a big, big issue. Mm -hmm. Another thing that you said that was really catchy to me was that you go and watch the memory card processing. As an observer, I also did that in Contra Costa County. And I noticed that, I mean, I went to several rooms where they store things, where they, um, they run ballots through machines, and then where they, they do the safety, the security checks on the provisionals, checking signatures, checking addresses, and multiple things. Um, almost any reason can eliminate that vote. And hopefully, you know, uh, by the multiple ways that they check signatures, it allows a big majority of them to, to be counted. But where do you go to watch the memory card proceed processing? I went to watch a Contra Costa, gosh, maybe eight years ago, and it's in another building. Most other counties, including San Diego, um, San Francisco, Alameda, there's a room where they have that tabulator and the central scanner in the case of San Francisco and there's a, a window there. Yeah. And you can't see what's going on on the screen, but at least you can see the people in there. 
in the case of Contra Costa, it's in some other building, and I didn't push it hard enough to insist on going to see it. Uh, I th they may be connected to somebody in the warehouse that's putting the, the cards into a reader and it goes on a wire. Uh, you'd have to ask them what's going on. Uh, we are delighted to have as many people showing up and wanting to watch things. And now we can start to check things in more detail, and this will be one of the benefits. So um, as part of the question today, you referenced um, in some notes to me to prepare for today, a few sections of, of rules that are from probably from the state. So section 1500, 1501, and 19320. It's on logic and accuracy testing. Can you give us um, some background on that? Generally in section 1500, it says, among other things, the counties are to test the voting machines before election day to make sure they operate. And they have a set of prepared ballots, and they put the ballots into the voting machines and check to see that the voting machine comes up with the results that you expect. And this is good. I'm glad they're doing it. Sometimes there actually are problems with the voting machines. They don't work and so on, so they have to take them out. Unfortunately, especially the, the companies that make these voting machines, they point to this logic and accuracy test and say, see, we tested them. They work. Well, it's less than that seems. For those of you who are familiar with the Volkswagen emission test problem that came up earlier this year, where Volkswagen, when they were submitting their cars for testing by the EPA, rigged the cars for the test. And what the EPA was measuring was not what uh, was actually on the road. Yeah. It's very easy to program these machines to know, and indeed in some of them, they, they go into a test mode. No, this is not the real thing, this is test mode. Hello, you better do it right. <laughs> so guess what? It comes out right when they're testing it. Yeah, right. But they put it into real action, and the, the computer knows which day it is, what time it is. Yeah. Is this election day at the time of the opening of the polls? Oh, I don't think this is a real test. This is no, this isn't a test. This is the real thing. So I'm going to do whatever I should be doing on, on election day, however you want to define that. The other point is there's something called an Easter egg, which is a little program that programmers can put into this whole system. And they don't function unless you know how to find it. And finding it means typing in certain secret keys or pressing certain candidates in a certain order. There's literally a million ways this can be done. And if you know how to activate it, and in the case of a polling place, somebody working with the insiders goes to the voting machine in a certain order, taps in the corners, they're going to act activate the Easter egg. Yeah. If those of you who've seen Clint Curtis testify before Congress about being paid to write a program to rig elections. This is what he was doing. And they said, well, can we detect it? And he said, no, absolutely not. Of course not, because you don't know how to activate it. Mm -hmm. And that's where this testing is nice as far as it goes, but it's not enough. We need to look at the source code. And then we need to audit the whole thing, both. You bring up some great points. And one of the things that I noticed as a poll worker was when I walked in and our my poll side to the machine had been kicked or dented on one side and had been blue taped shut because you know we use blue tape to put signs up on the wall so the only thing we had um, there and the inspector or someone must have blue taped one side shut and the other side was open and unlocked so I'm wondering if at any point that machine had been messed with before our arrival so a lot of these machines are delivered the night before. Um, and stay all night by themselves in a building, in a church, or anywhere where it's at. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about the federal testing and how that might be different than California? 
the federal election assistance commission was set up by the hava bill of 2002 or four help america vote act and the idea was that the government was going to assist the states in running elections this is uh, something states can opt into. But then if you want federal money, you had to opt, it, opt into it. So, okay, it wasn't all that voluntary. And they initially set up something called the ITAs, the Independent Testing Authority, to test the machines according to a set of federal standards. Well, the there was really one testing authority and it was one guy in Alabama and guess who paid him to test the election machines the election company the, the company that made the machines paid the guy to test the systems that's a huge conflict of interest it's a huge conflict of interest and activists pointed this out and a few years ago they said well maybe this is not the right way to do it and so the Election Assistance Commission manages the testing and whoever is going to test your system gets chosen at random. So that removes some of that, but for many years there was what has to be called a sham going on with testing. Now in the Election Assistance, Assistance Commission, there, they have four commissioners and all of them chosen by Congress, two Republicans, two Democrats. And in the past few years, the Republicans refused to confirm anybody. Hmm. Just this past year, they finally started confirming commissioners and put people on it. But for a while, the Election Assistance Commission was headless. And they, um, they weren't doing anything. Well, California said, one, this testing is a sham. And, and two, there are standards that we can do better. So Senator Alex Padilla passed a bill, SB 360, to take California out of the federal testing and said, we're going to do it ourselves. Uh, activists said, um, we want to make sure that this is good. So the law said, we're going to do it ourselves and we're going to do it at least as good as the federal standards. And Deborah Bowen was still Secretary of State when this law passed, and they wrote a 200-page document, which is the standards according to which you will test the systems. That standard is better than what the federal government is doing. I read through the whole thing, and I can tell you that. There's, I don't know, maybe 20 people in the whole state who read through this whole thing, but it's, it's good. They did a good job, and we need to stay to those standards, we need to modularize them. I think we're going to see some changes next year about that, so you don't have to go through this entire testing process, which can take a year. It costs over a million dollars, and the companies are very reluctant to submit new systems in that are that costly, that take that much time. Mm -hmm. So the federal system is maybe with new commissioners going to get better, but California is out of that loop. We're doing it on our own, and I think we're doing a better job. One of the things you mentioned and that I learned of uh, the Help America Vote Act was that um, it also helped create a database of signatures. And in Contra Costa County, they were, um, they've been holding people's signatures for about 20 years. So if you signed a provisional, your vote by mail envelope, uh, and within the last 20 years, your signature's on file. So if it's changed at all or whatever, this is kind of a safety thing. It's actually protecting um, your vote because in the process of it, someone saying, oh, this is not the right signature, they can check once, two, and a third time to see if it matches through their internal database. And one of the things they mentioned to me as an observer was that um, next year, hopefully, the Help America Vote Act was going to help them cost country, I mean county in California, cost county use each other's database to check if someone moved. So if I lived in Alameda County five years ago and now live in Contra Costa or Merced, then I would be able to, as a new registered voter in that county, the supervisor or whatever would check the other county 
and check my signature to see if it's a valid uh, vote and allow it to go through. And I thought that was uh, somewhat of an improvement, although kind of scary that they would have my signature stored for that long and possibly hackable as well. <laughs> so uh, there you go. Um, so can you tell us about the uh, certification documents and what are those procedures? For people who are going to observe the system in a county, you need to do some more homework. When the Secretary of State certifies a system for use in California, they tend to do this dance and say, well, we're not certifying it, but we're approving it for use. And then they will write up a certificate of approval, which by itself has a whole bunch of regulations about how you can use that system in this state. And you can find those documents online uh, at the Secretary of State's office. For the Sequoia system, there are, for example, 40 conditions that they have to meet. One of which is, uh, you essentially says, and this is where California is very good, is if you're going to have people vote on a voting machine, you get that adding machine tape, you're going to hand count every vote off of that tape as a double check. Mm -hmm. Everyone. For the systems that have that regulation, Sequoia and people, or two of them, they're going to hand count them. So what happens is the registrars put the machines in the corner because they don't want to have this long tape and try to hand count the votes on them. They just say, okay, we're just going to give people people paper ballots and we can run them through scanners. Um, that'll be easier and theoretically more accurate for everybody. Um, so there are 40 rules for Sequoia, about 40 rules for people for that system. And then the company has to write a use manual of how you use this, going through even more detailed steps of how you use this machine. And it gets into detail. And you need to find out for your county what system they are using in that county and go look at those two documents and you can get to know the rules. Mm -hmm. Because those are where the loopholes are. And you need to get to know them. At least some people on, on the team need to study those. And then say, no, wait a minute, it says you're supposed to do this or that. And make sure they're doing it. Again, for example, um, wireless is forbidden in voting systems in California. You can't use them. Well, how do you know that they're not using them? Find out. And, and try to check on that because somebody can sit outside if they if they're very good they can sit outside in a truck and if they can connect to the wireless system any wireless system they can sit in a truck and they have all day to have at it and to get in and then do whatever they want and again the machine that they're going to have at first of all is going to be that central tabulator that's the most vulnerable piece of them all so, earlier we talked about the delivery of equipment, you know, how they get delivered to the poll sites the day before. Um, tell me more about the sleepover of these equipment at the poll sites. This is a problem we knew about 10 years ago and was discussed during Deborah Bowen's campaign. Counties will hand out voting machines and tabulators, precinct scanners, not, it's not tabulators, precinct scanners, to precinct workers, even the Friday before the election. And they'll put them in their trunk and drive them home. And that voting equipment will stay overnight, that's what we call sleepover, in somebody's house for a day, two days, three days, leaving plenty of opportunity for somebody to get at them. And people have talked about, well, let's have FedEx deliver all of them for the entire four and a half thousand precincts in Los Angeles County uh, and get them there on time, election morning, et cetera, et cetera. Right now, this is a logistical nightmare and we haven't come up with a good solution for that. So. Be aware that those machines, some of them, 
I'll say a minority, but might have stayed over at somebody's house for overnight or longer. And again, that's that's a gap that we need to be aware of and need to deal with yeah. because they could fiddle with the machines while they're sitting in somebody's garage. Yeah. And as a ballot observer, <coughs> you know, you could observe almost any process of the election. You know, most people are used to observing the ballot count going into the warehouse or your county's registrar where they actually process um, these precinct votes and um, actually the ones that don't uh, maybe have double votes on them or they don't fill it in the bubble correctly, those get remade and recounted in your at your county. Um, but then the vote by mails and provisionals get counted at the registrar. And um, that, to me, um, just alerted to me that, you know, when you're observing those processes, you can also observe prior to that. But I can't imagine that I can go to someone's ha house and observe you know, making sure that the machines are correct. So that's another problem for observer. If you wanted to be a part of another uh, process, not just observing the count, you may not be able to have access to certain places because of where they're at. And um, so that's uh, uh, something that you would be limited to as, a, as your right to be able to try to protect the vote for anybody in your county. So the, um, another question I have for you is, um, how can we assure the chain of custody between the precinct and the county headquarters? Do you have some suggestions for that? Yeah. Again, going from the precinct back to the county, you have ballots, you have these memory cards, you have all kinds of documents. Sometimes some precinct captains will have, I've, I've heard of this happening in the morning. They have, he, he already has, or she already has, documents that are supposed to be signed saying, yes, we, the undersigned, have checked that, this said what it said. And the precinct captain just gives it to him in the morning to sign them. Even though nobody's seen the document that say, that they're affirming says what it says. So they're already violating the law and the uh, spirit of the law and the letter of the law by going ahead and signing some of these. Well, these documents say, yeah, we counted so many ballots for provisionals, we yeah. took in mm -hmm. so many vote by mail. That's a lot of details. Right. And part of a real professional audit would be to check those things. Right. So you can ask to see those documents, and you should ask to see those documents. Another thing that people generally don't think of, but when all of these documents and the ballots and the ballot cards, the ballot box, the electronic cards, are going from precinct to the county headquarters, follow them. Yeah. Get in the car and follow them. Be nice, be polite. Hey, we're not going to rob you, we're just observing and we want to observe the transfer of this important vital information from the precinct to the county. Bev Harris has seen stuff going on in New England that was not normal. And it's just sort of a good idea to make sure that you know what's going on while the information is going back to county headquarters. Yeah. Um, again, back to my poll working experience. I remember the inspector, a very, very, uh, seemed like a very nice man, but at the same time, uh, very firm on how he ran his ship. And at one point, he had the receipts of all these counts of how many provisionals and how many um, had been dropped, vote by mails had been uh, dropped off. Um, and, you know, they roll it up and say, here, sign here. And, you know, you know I asked, what am I signing? And um, I don't want, everybody has to sign it. And it's a, you felt a considerable amount of pressure just to do it. You know, and I managed to, like, while he was looking away, to open it up a bit, and I was like, okay, this seems a little different than my experience when you're looking at all the details of the numbers, but it's so, like, smashed and condensed into these little uh, uh, rows and columns that you just, you really don't know what you're reading. It's not simple. Well, it should be. Um, you think it is. It's just, like, to have to read it in 10 seconds or 50 with the pressure you're feeling, 
um, from your inspector. It really doesn't allow time to read. It's, you know, they're, they're on a deadline. The, the, the doors close at 8, and they're supposed to deliver them by a certain amount of time, and you have to count every ballot, if you know, if you receive 300 or whatever, because the machine, the scanner, also tells them how many uh, ballots actually went through the machine. You've got to match all that up. And um, so if you don't sign and you're trying to pressure the inspector back to give you time to read, it's frowned upon. And so you really have to defend yourself and uh, you're right as a poll worker from your inspector, feeling like he's bullying you a bit around, don't let that happen. So I just want to give that um, advice to the audience here who's working, who's watching us. And uh, I'm just going to pause really quick and remind you that a lot of these issues that we're talking about here, we're going to cover them at our conference on October 8th and 9th. This is an emergency conference to prepare for the upcoming elections and beyond. And it's going to be in Richmond, California at Grace Lutheran Church. We invite everybody to come. Um, the link to this is tinyurl.com at Take Back the Vote. And we're going to start at 9.30 a.m. on Saturday and Sunday. And our keynote speaker is actually going to be Bob Petrakis. Um, and we're also going to have Bill Simpich um, there with us, helping us train, and um, a lot of his colleagues. And Jim Soper will also be there with us to help um, go over other elements of election. And we want everyone uh, who's able and willing to come. And if this is important to you, please come join us. So, Jim, um, this uh, week we had a DNC uh, hack. Uh, the uh, Well, let me correct myself. WikiLinked released a DNC contract that showed the hacking of voter rolls. Can you tell us about... Uh, this and what is the impact that uh, towards Nevada? WikiLeaks. This came out this week. WikiLeaks came out with a contract uh, written by the DNC Democratic National Committee, and at the top it says this is a, a contract between the DNC and the states. Somebody named Matt had this all over Twitter and he had four or 5,000 retweets and he says, see, the DNC can hack voter rolls, official voter rolls. Here's the proof. Uh-uh. I can understand you read that first sentence. Yeah, you might get that impression, deal, uh, contract between the DNC and the states, but what it really meant was the deep between the DNC and the state parties, not the state governments. And as I read down through it, that became clear. Well, two things became clear. One, it was between the parties, not the governments. Um, so the government, your official databases of voters, the DNC did not have direct access to. It. The names on those voter rolls are public, is public information. You can go into many, if not all, California counties and maybe give them 10 bucks, I don't know what it is, it varies from county to county, and get the list of everybody who's allowed to vote in that county, who's on the registration roll with their, with their address. Phone number. Phone number, if you don't put it down, folks. If you don't want phone calls, don't put in your phone number. Their party affiliation. Party affiliation you put in. Um, Does it tell you if you voted before? It will note if whether or not you voted. A whole bunch of information. This is public information, and anybody can go get it. So the state parties go collect this information from uh, the counties, and then they put it in their own state party database. And the contract was every twice a year, the DNC and the state parties that choose to participate are going to share this information. And there's there's a diagram that I, I we're not set up to show you, but off on the left it showed a little box for state voter rolls, and that was the official copy of the official. It wasn't the, it wasn't uh, it was a copy of the official state border rolls. And in that diagram, they had some arrows showing arrows going into the DNC, and then they had orange arrows. There was no orange arrow going back to those state voter rolls that were held by the state party. The DNC, in this case, did not have direct link back to that state party information. 
So the DNC did not uh, have access to the official, the ability to change official state voter rules, at least not in this contract. Uh, somebody followed up and said, yeah, well, in the Nevada caucuses, we saw a whole bunch of problems with people going into the caucuses. And they're, they're being told, well, you're not registered. That's a different issue because a caucus is not run by the government. It's run by the party. It's run by the state party. And then that contract comes into play. And I don't know if these problems with voter registrations are caused by a glitch. If not, what was who did it? If not, wh why? There are a whole bunch of questions that you should be asking before you start pointing figures, fingers at a specific individual and say, that person rigged the election. You don't know, at least not with starting from that contract. It's a whole lot of things that you need to check before you start pointing fingers like that. And if this was just a case where the social media, social networks just went nuts with this. And it was really hard to try to try to correct it. I did what I could, but it just was misinformation that we see so often, mm -hmm. especially on Twitter. So just for clarity, we're saying that the parties go and get the data of the voter rolls for their use. Mm -hmm. But are we also say, saying that the parties do not give the state their information and finding of someone's uh, data being updated to correct it on the state level? Does that happen? I can't answer that. I don't know. It wasn't in that contract. Okay. Um, another thing that just came to mind is that I've, being involved in campaigns, you know, I have seen parties become, uh, have access to these lists, and sometimes they get them on in January. But people register to vote, you know, between January and June for a primary or May. So if they don't have the latest list, they might not have a complete list of every voter. And I don't even know if you have to pay again to get a new list and how expensive that is. But if someone with who is able and willing to uh, pay for the cost would probably get a newer list. And I just don't know I what that implications so. um, are so. for someone in Nevada who's uh, trying to vote. But that's something that maybe you would be interested to look into in your state. Um, and maybe uh, one more last question before we turn and spend five minutes with our audience. If there's any questions, please uh, chime in now. And then we're going to have Lucy Riley, who's joining us, um, read us off the, the question. So, um, Jim, Homeland Security is getting involved in elections. I am uh, panicking over this. I just, you know, I've been in the immigrant rights movement for a very long time as an advocate. And um, I just, you know, I don't really, I see the different ways that Homeland Security has handled immigration cases um, and their processing. How can we um, trust or maybe not trust Homeland Security with our elections? One, don't complete, completely trust anybody with our elections. You always want to double check things. Don't trust me. Go check what I say, please. Because I'm not going to always get it right and the election officials will not always get it right. What we saw, we, we've been saying for well over 10 years, these machines are hackable. They're vulnerable and they're important. They're mission critical. They're a national asset. Uh, we need to protect them. Well, finally, 10 years later, uh, somebody hacked into the DNC emails and so on and WikiLeak does, and it dawned on people, hmm, maybe elections really are important. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and maybe we ought to be treating this as a national asset and protect it better than we are. And so the FBI issued a, an alert to the states, and Homeland Security then said, gee, our elections are a national asset, part of the infrastructure, the critical infrastructure that we need to protect. Now what Homeland Security does in principle, and yes, 
double check them so that they don't overstep their bounds. But there was a document written by Secretary Johnson saying, we are here to provide advice to any election officials who want, who want advice about how to secure their systems. And these are people that are knowledgeable about this. And so, hey, I'm glad now that what we've been saying for 10 years, that these systems are vulnerable to you, the FBI agrees with us, and Homeland Security agrees with us, we're no longer nuts. We're saying, we've been saying the same thing for 10 years, and now we've got the government agreeing. If the Homeland Security has some good advice to offer to states and counties, please. And they're offering, we will take a look at your system and see what vulnerabilities. There were a couple states that said, oh, we're not interested. Those were states in the South that have no paper trail. And they don't want Homeland Security looking at their system and saying, gee, you have no paper backup. You have no way to audit this. They didn't want that somebody else was looking in who actually had an idea what security could be about. Yes, they can misuse it. And yes, we need to be uh, vigilant that they don't overstep their bounds. But they're there to offer advice. And if somebody's there to offer advice, I think some people should be listening to it. So. I'm not panicked about this. Yes, yeah. I want to be cautious. But the people who are refusing it are the very people that need it the most. Yeah. So that should be a sign that maybe this is a good thing. Yeah. Could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. And um, one of the things that I you know, have realized is that uh, the way it is now, we seem to have at least some level of access to observe as voters, as civic participants. You don't have to be a voter to observe. Uh, you don't even have to be a citizen to observe the ballot process. If this is important to you, you can go to your county registrar and get involved. Um, all you have to do is sign in your name and uh, which group are you are. If you're there for yourself, you write in self. Uh, but if Homeland Security gets involved, you know, are they taking the ballots immediately to some central place in that county? Are they going to process mm -hmm. them? Will they stay locally? I mean, those are the kind of questions that are going to start coming up. The other thing you'll want to do is look at who from your state and county levels would be involved with Homeland Security to set up that type of process. And if that's something that you will support, um, and if something is not your, you will not support, you need to let. Um, the administration, our federal administration, know that that's something yeah. that you do not, um, you're not ready for, and you want to see either uh, better uh, voting machines or better hand uh, paper counted ballot processes. Um, this is where we're asking you to get involved based on what you know or learn more, so that you can um, uh, really be a voice for uh, what it is you believe is correct. Um, and so I want to thank you, Jim, for this process. And please post your questions um, online. And Jim checks these uh, uh, link regularly. And he will try to answer your questions. There's also a link to that diagram we went over on there. Next Sunday, same time, 5 p.m., we'll be here to do another topic with a, a guest. And then we'll prepare that and announce it around Wednesday. Uh, so keep an eye out on Ballots for Bernie for that. And um, the last thing I want to mention is our conference. You've heard us mention this every week. It's really important for us because we realize that um, elections is important. There's a, a big wave of people in each state and our count in our country that is more involved in participating in, in elections, different than we've ever been before. And you need to form groups and local groups um, to really protect the vote in your area. And the more in sync we can be at a national level, the the, uh, um, the processes could be standardized somehow. We can um, monitor this a lot better. Every state does it differently. Every state issues different guidelines to each county, and each county can process elections differently as well. And so um, start at your county level, and then also check um, what these uh, processes are. 
um, as it trickles down from the state to your county and get involved. Um, and another thing that I will ask um, um, you to get involved is follow also other great groups like Election Just in the USA. They made a, an announcement that they're going to do a live stream on September 27th. And that's something that we need to, to pay attention to because they're going to go over um, uh, hand, paper, counted ballots and talk about that. So if you want to learn more about that, uh, please look at Election Justice USA's um, uh, 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 Facebook page and their live stream that I will launch on the 27th. And then um, the other thing we have going on is our conference. Um, we have a sponsor, our trustvote.org. Um, is sponsoring a conference to allow us to do a, um, have a better success, have great speakers at our conference, and um, we're very thankful for their support. And you can also donate to our cause um, at GoFundMe.com uh, slash Take Back the Vote. And we appreciate any donation you can make in any amount that is comfortable to you to help put this uh, conference together and help sponsor individuals poll workers, poll watchers, anyone who wants to get involved um, in elections, uh, we want to sponsor them to come here. So please to make a donation. Um, GoFundMe.com slash Take Back the Vote. Thank you.